Joseph is taken out of jail after his 12 years being in jail. But before we continue to learn more about what Joseph is going to do, let's take a step back and understand where he came from. We know Joseph was his father's favorite. Joseph was 17 years old when he was kidnapped by his brothers and sold as a slave. So he spent his first 17 years with his father, by his father's side. His father taught him everything he knew, everything he learned from his grandfather Abraham, everything he learned from his father Isaac, and everything he learned from the famous yeshiva of Shem and Ever for those 14 years that he spent there on his way to his father-in-law's house before he built his family. So Joseph is this hyper genius and also a very righteous man. Well, lad, 17 years old. He gets sold and he finds himself in a new world. He finds himself in Egypt and he is bought by Potiphar. Potiphar, different interpretations, who and what his position and his rank actually was in Egypt. He was definitely an aristocrat. He was definitely a high level and important individual. Some say that, according to Rashi, that he was the head chef or slaughterer of animals for Paro and the palace and all the great noblemen. Others, specifically Unkelus, explains that Potiphar was actually the head of or the person in charge of anyone who deserved capital punishment. That was who he was. Sar HaTabachim. Tabachim could be translated as the butcher or the butcher, right? So that's exactly who, who he was. Nevertheless, a very important individual. Joseph at the age of 17 finds himself at the bottom. He walks in at janitor level and he climbs his way up in importance and responsibility to being in charge of his whole household. His business matters, his home matters. As the Torah says, Potiphar says, everything is yours except for my bed, which is a nice way to say, except for my wife. And that's how it was. The problem is Potiphar was not a very good individual. He actually didn't pay the best respect and attention to his wife, namely he was a homosexual according to most opinions. And Potiphar's wife started to develop an attraction towards this young, good-looking, wise, powerful kid, 17 years old. And she got him in a lot of trouble. She was looking for the trouble. Joseph wasn't looking for the trouble, but it got him in trouble. Joseph spent only 12 months in Potiphar's house before the scandal Potiphar's wife pulled off and got him ended up in jail. In jail he spent 10 years and then another two. The reason for those other two years is because he put his faith at his level in the butler's hands. He told the butler on his way out, please don't forget to mention me to Paro. Don't forget me. And because of that, he was sentenced to an additional two years in jail. So if we do the math, he was 17, plus another year at Potiphar, that's 18. Plus another 10, that is 28, and then another two years, to make it a total of 12 years in jail, Joseph is standing at 30 years old in front of the most powerful human being in the world at that time, Paro. And he stood there, and he is brought to him. He is shaved and garmented, to a nobleman, and he's brought to interpret Paro's dream. And he does so. And he says an answer Paro was happy with after seeking so many answers. Finally, Joseph comes and says, the seven allude to the seven years of plenty, and then the seven which follow and devour are the seven years of hunger and famine, which will, if we don't do anything, wipe Egypt off the face of this earth. And he gave him a way to take care of it. Joseph, by the way, according to many opinions, was the first individual the world saw to invent a capital gains tax. 
So we could thank him for it, or we could not. But what Joseph said was, every land, every field, every harvest, every crop, 20% during the seven years of plenty are going to be collected and stored in silos and then distributed to those who contributed towards it during the years of famine so we will not perish. Anyone who didn't contribute, especially outsiders or visitors or people in other countries, came to buy. And anyone who couldn't buy became slaves. And this was the beginning of Egypt's stronghold in slavery because people who came, whether locals or from abroad, who did not contribute and did not have money to buy food, they sold themselves as slave for food. And then even after the famine was over, they then remained slaves because they wouldn't have stayed alive. They wouldn't have continued to live if they would not have been fed that food. And Egypt became, at that point, the strongest country again in the world and had many, many, many slaves. So Joseph is there and he gives them this interpretation, gives them this solution. And Paro tells Joseph, and I'll quote to you, we are in chapter 41, verses 39 and 40. It says, Vayomer Paro el Yosef, Paro tells Joseph, after God, as you said, Joseph, told you all of this, there is no one who is so discerning and so wise as you, Joseph. And then Paro continues, I want you to be in charge of my house and this whole country. And I want the whole country, the whole nation, to kiss the words that you say, to heed to what you say. Only the throne, meaning only my rulership, Paro says, is something which is above you. The whole country, the strongest country in the world, was given to Joseph to do as he pleases, for it to be most successful, and everything was given to him except for Paro's throne himself. Deja vu, no? 12 years prior, 13 years prior, the same was given to him in Potiphar's house. And Joseph accepted. Joseph got married. Joseph did the work he had to do for those next seven years before meeting his brothers. If we stop one moment, as the Zerah Shimshon does and says, look at Joseph. Joseph did something wrong. He did three things which were wrong, which brought him to where he is today. One of those three things was that he told his father about the way his brothers tr treated the children of the two slaves of Bilhan and Zilpa. He said three nasty things that his brothers were doing to his father. And the reason why he was sold as a slave was as a punishment for him speaking not nice about the way his brothers treated his brothers, which were the children of the slaves, Zilpa and Bilhah's children. So the six children of Leah were not treating nicely the four children, the two and two of the maidservants. And because of that, his punishment was that he would be sold as a slave. Zerah Shimshon says, one second. If his punishment was to be sold as a slave, why was his reward afterwards overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly strong? It seems like there's a disconnect between the punishment and then the future reward. Meaning, if Joseph was punished to be a slave, and then he would do teshuvah, he would repent, so let him get the gift of freedom, but not the gift of being the second most powerful human being in the world, being the second to king, being the viceroy. There's a disconnect. So he did something wrong, he was sold as a slave, and now he's the most powerful person? How does that make sense? Zerashim Shon wants to know. 
So listen to his answer. He says that whatever happened to Joseph was a sample of what's going to happen to the Jewish people in the future. Not only Joseph, the same with Abraham, the same with Isaac, the same with Jacob, and with Joseph as well. Joseph was sent into exile. He was sold as a slave. The Jewish people very soon are going to go into exile as well. They're going to come to Egypt the same way Joseph came to Egypt. And there's going to be a descent. And they themselves, the Jewish people, will become slaves. But look at the end of the story. The end of the story is that Joseph came up strong and Joseph came up on top. And this was alluding to the Jewish people in the future as well. That even after their exile, they will come up on top. The Midrash tells us that there were three things that the Jewish people merited only because of the exile in Egypt. Number one, receiving the Torah. Number two, receiving the land of Israel. And number three, the gift of Olam Haba, the next world. These three things only came about because of the Jewish people being exiled to Egypt. The way the Zer Shimshon explains it, and I'm modifying it a little, is when something needs to <coughs> gum up, needs to rise, Look at it like a ball. How do you get a ball up high? Well, you can throw it up, but it also bounces. When a ball hits the floor, it bounces right back up. And so too, on a global, national, communal, family, personal level, when one goes down, it's not all over. It's just something which breaks down, hits the bottom, and then gets lifted and put back together by God Himself and raised up tall, strong, high, in an even better capacity than before. B'nai Israel were exiled. They came up strong after. They got the Torah, they got the, the land of Israel, they got the gift of the next world. Joseph's brothers intended on throwing him into the pit, taking him out, selling him like a slave forevermore. But God had a better plan. Joseph had to hit the rock bottom before exponentially growing to be the second most powerful human being in the world at that time. The one who was feeding with his own hands the whole world during the famine. He was only able to get to that after he hit the floor and bounced up all the way up with the help and the assistance of God. So the Torah is telling us there's no disconnect between Joseph's, Joseph's punishment and his reward. His punishment was to go all the way down to rock bottom. But it's not over then. He was able to be brought up by God all the way to the top. And this lesson is so pertaining and powerful to us all. At a diff each of us in our own time in life, there are dark times. Sometimes a person goes into exile. Sometimes the Jewish people go into exile. But it's not any reason to despair. Yes, sometimes we need to worry, we need to try hard, we need to do our thing, but it doesn't mean it's over because every descent ends off in an ascent, in rising. And this is a strong lesson we learn from Joseph. Don't get down over things which are hard. Joseph had a great spirit, great spirit as a slave, great spirit as in jail, not knowing if he'd ever come out of there. And so too, each and every one of us in our own lives. When it gets bumpy, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that's only able to be done in a genuine and healthy way when we have imuna, when we have our belief in God, when our convictions about the purpose of life are unshakable because of our connection to God through His Torah and through fulfilling His mitzvot, the commandments. When we have that, a descent is like a descent in a roller coaster. I don't know about you, but I love that descent of the roller coaster. When your heart starts to come up on you and you know that you're gone right back up afterwards, that's the way we need to take our exiles. That's the way, the way we need to take our descents. It's just a roller coaster. Okay, 
It's not 30 seconds long, it's not two minutes long. Sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's even longer. There's health complications, there's family complications, there's financial complications. Everyone has their own thing, emotional, psychological complications. It's fine. All of that is part of the ascent. And when we realize that, and we come strong with an unshaking belief in God, it's definitely a good coping mechanism how to work our way up and through it. But if we really believe it, we will see and understand that God is going to be there for us and He will rise us. Remember a ball. Ball bounces, but it comes back up stronger. That force that it comes up with is the force of God collecting whatever is broken. Removing all the bad, right? Joseph did something wrong. So he had to become a slave. After he was a slave, God took off the bad. He let him, gave him atonement for that sin. Then he was able to raise him up to a higher place. That's the Kabbalistic concept of klipot, of shells. A shell is to remove something that is no good. So when a person does something wrong, we come down into repentance, into exile, into worry, into hardship. That klipa, that shell comes off. And then God's able to raise us to an even higher and greater place. May the merit of the Zer Shimshon stand for ourselves, our families, community, and all Am Israel. Amen, amen.